wisdom of we the people two centuries ago provides freedom under security two centuries later for we the people 2003 is a striking theme and I commend to all of you a visit to the National Constitution Center that shows that while we the people have changed from those 42 brilliant framers to a much more diverse, multiracial, multicultural, broad democratic populace today, the principles of freedom that were set forth in that great document two centuries ago still stand strong. But what happens if, as we have been since the terrible events of September 11, 2001, in a state of national emergency? What happens to the Constitution in wartime? What happens to civil liberties in times of national security crisis? I'd like to talk about that today, first by laying out two different views of how the Constitution should work in times of crisis, then telling you which one of those is the better approach, in my view, and then applying that approach to a few contemporary examples, ending up with concerns about procedure, privacy, and profile. But let's begin with two very different views of how the Constitution should operate in wartime or times of national security crisis. Let me sketch the first view, which I'll call the view that the Constitution is continuous, one unbroken fabric meant to protect us in good times or bad. And to sketch that view, let me begin by quoting from a case called Ex parte Milligan. This was a case in which the United States Supreme Court, after the Civil War had ended, rebuked President Lincoln for all his greatness for having violated the Constitution during the war. The specific violation was that he unilaterally suspended the great writ of habeas corpus, that inheritance from the English common law that allows any of us who's been taken into custody by the executive branch to say, I want to be heard by a court. Habeas corpus literally means hand over the body. And in suspending habeas corpus, Lincoln thought he could do it on his own without the assent of Congress. In saying that had been wrong, the Supreme Court wrote the following lines. It said, the Constitution of the United States is a law for rulers and people equally in war and peace. And no doctrine involving more pernicious consequences was ever invented by the wit of man than that any of its provisions can be suspended during any of the great exigencies of government. Now, those were bold words from the Supreme Court. You might take note that the year was 1866, after the hostilities in the Civil War had ended. And you might say that perhaps no court can really discipline the executive during wartime. But let's take as our principle from Milligan the idea that there is one continuous constitution, unbroken from 1789 to 2003, and unbroken even in times of national security crisis. Let me give you another example of the view that the Constitution is continuous even in times of national emergency. Let's go back a half century to 1952, when a threatened labor strike in the nation's steel mills threatened to imperil the supply of munitions to troops already committed to hostilities in Korea. And let's recall that President Harry Truman, perhaps not wanting to take on the unions, but certainly not wanting to imperil the troops, decided to issue an executive order taking over the steel mills, running up the stars and stripes instead of the corporate flag over their headquarters. That case went on an expedited basis up to the United States Supreme Court, where the Supreme Court, in an opinion by Justice Black, and a concurrence by the great Justice Robert Jackson, who's immortalized in the center in his honor in Jamestown, and who's been a topic of your discussion here at Chautauqua this week, the opinions by Justice Black and Justice Jackson said Truman was not allowed to seize the steel notes. 
It exceeded presidential power. The president doesn't have unlimited power to do what he thinks right for the nation, even at times of war and crisis. Uh, Truman, by the way, was quite unrepentant about seizing the steel mills. Uh, he wrote his biography and done the right thing. And there's a story that I heard from Justice Sandra Day O'Connor, a frequent Chautauqua well known to you all. Justice O'Connor reports that later that year, there was a dinner party at Justice Black's house to which the president was invited. She reports that the conversation was a little stiff that evening, Truman having been slapped on the wrist by the Supreme Court. But as the drinks flowed, things loosened up. And at the end of the evening, President Truman said to Justice Black, well, sir, your law is no good, but your bourbon is. <laughs> state. 
the idea that the government must above all preserve its own ongoing existence and that other aspects of its foundations, like its constitutional protection of liberties, must yield to the executive's overriding prerogative to defend the government against paramount necessity. But I'm going to argue to you that our Constitution does not adopt raison d'etat, that our Constitution stands for the principle, as interpreted by the courts, of a continuous Constitution, unbroken from 1789 to 2003. And I'd like to suggest to you four reasons why the continuous Constitution view is better than the view that we can just tear black holes in the fabric of constitutional law when we face even the gravest national security crises. The four reasons I'd like to give you are first, the theories of what constitutions are for. Second, some thinking from the text of our own constitution. Third, a few lessons from history. And fourth, a few reflections on our current international context. Now let's start with the theory of the constitution. Why do we have a written constitution? Why don't we just trust the executive? There are nations today, liberal, western, industrialized democracies like Great Britain, which don't have written constitutions. But the theory of a constitution is that like the famous story of Ulysses, who didn't want to be tempted by the siren's song into dashing himself to death on the rocks where these mythical temptresses sang. The story that Homer told us about Ulysses was that he had his hands tied to the mast so that he could resist temptation even while he heard the siren's sound. Or to take a metaphor that's maybe a little more comfortable and familiar in modern day life, especially with the bounties offered you at the Hotel Athenaeum, <laughs> the metaphor of a diet. Why do we have diets? We go on a diet to resist temptation just when it is greatest at the dessert table. <laughs> now the principle of a constitution is that we should resist yielding to temptation even when it's not the attraction of foods or sorceresses, when it's not the sound of sirens in the sense of mythical sorceresses, but the sound of sirens screaming from calamities as ambulances and fire trucks and police trucks attend them. We should not give into the temptation of fear any more to the temptation of seduction. That's the theory of what a constitution is. It exists most importantly for the difficult times, not for the easy times. And if that's what a constitution is, if that's its theory, it's a hands tying device, it's a form of political diet, then the last time you want to suspend it is when the going gets tough. But let me turn second to the text of our constitution. And let me point out to you one of its most important features, something that isn't there. It's like the famous line about Sherlock Holmes, he says, did you notice something about the dog, my dear Watson? What about the dog, dear Holmes? The dog didn't bark in the night. Ah, yes, dear Watson, that's the very point. The dog didn't bark in the night. Sometimes what doesn't happen is even more important than what does. And something that didn't happen in our constitutional framing is the framers did not put in an emergency provision. They didn't put in any general emergency provision providing for the Constitution's suspension in times of crisis. Now why is that striking, the emergency provision that did not work in the bank? Most other constitutions in written form in industrialized nations in the modern world do have emergency provisions. They do provide for their own suspension. Let me cite to you, for example, the Constitution of India, the world's largest democracy. The Indian Constitution, says that in a state of emergency, the president may suspend the judiciary's authority to enforce the Constitution's fundamental rights. Or take the Constitution of South Africa, whose drafting in the wake of the fall of apartheid and the celebratory environment in which people long barred from voting were able to walk to the polls for the first time as a majority in their own nation,
The drafting of the South African Constitution was an event invested with great intellect, great thought, great influence from the American Constitution. And the South African Constitution, again, provided for an emergency exception. It, it provides that Parliament may declare, and it may then extend, a state of emergency. The longer the state of emergency is, the more votes are required. Supermajority is required to keep it going. The Parliament may declare and extend a state of emergency, and in that state of emergency may pass laws that, quote, derogate from the fundamental rights in the Bill of Rights. Derogate from, that is, suspend. Now, interestingly, South Africa says there are some rights that are inalienable, even in the states of emergency, including the right to be free from discrimination on the basis of race, equality on the basis of race. But India and South Africa illustrate that if you want to, you can put in a provision for suspending the Constitution in an emergency. The United States Constitution has no such provision. Now you might be thinking, there are so many emergency provisions in the United States Constitution, and that would be true. For example, in Article 1, Section 8, Clause 15, the Constitution says that the Congress shall have the power to provide for calling for the militia to execute the laws of the nation and suppress insurrections and repel invasions. And Article 2 provides that if the state militias ever are called up to repel invasions or suppress insurrections, the United States President shall be their commander. And Article 1, Section 10, Clause 3, which provides that normally the states may not keep troops and may not declare war or engage in war, it says, well, they may not do so unless the states are actually invaded or in such imminent danger as will not admit of delay. And Article 4, Section 4, likewise has a mini-emergency provision. It says that Congress shall protect each state against invasion, and if the states ask the national government to, it shall protect them against domestic violence. But notice that none of those mini-emergency clauses, none of them, provides for a suspension of rights during the emergency. They just provide for extra powers, and it's envisioned that that extra power will be used sparingly and in only a temporary way. The only clause in the Constitution that imagines the suspension of any rights is the one I've already referred to, the clause about habeas corpus. Article 1, Section 9, Clause 2 says the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus that writ that says you can go to court any time the executive has you in custody, the privilege of the writ of habeas corpus shall not be suspended unless, when in cases of rebellion or invasion, the public safety may require it. And of course, in Lincoln's confrontation with the Congress, the court said the president may not suspend habeas corpus unilaterally, he may do so only with the consent of Congress. Now, those many emergency powers and that one limited emergency exception for the suspension of rights do not an emergency provision make. We don't have a provision for the Constitution's own suspension. And in fact, you might regard the fact that the framers told us that much about emergencies and didn't go all the way to a general emergency exception means by negative implication they didn't want us to have a general emergency exception to the Constitution. But maybe you say that's too general, the theory of a Constitution as a diet or hands-tying device, or that exegesis of the text in which we say, aha, there's no general emergency provision. Doesn't prudence tell us that maybe we need to suspend the Constitution in times of crisis? Well, I want to suggest to you as a third argument in favor of the continuous Constitution, the answer to that is no. The prudence and history tell us that when we are tempted to suspend the rights, to deviate from the principles of the founding in times of emergency, we have always come later, in hindsight, to view that as an overreaction. As an overreaction at the time that we can see clearly after the fact was a bit improper 
were even hysterical. And let me give you three examples from history in which I think the later verdict of history was that the overreaction at the time of the emergency was excessive. Let's go back to Lincoln for a moment. Let's remember what happened during Lincoln's suspension of the writ of habeas corpus from 1861 to 1865. Well, it's true that some of the 13,000 civilians locked up in military rigs during the pursuit of the Civil War were a threat to the Union troops. Some of those locked up were people who wanted to dynamite the bridges that were going to carry Union troops into areas of battle. But a great many others of the 13,000 locked up during the suspension of the writ of habeas corpus without access to civilian court, a great many of those folks were political dissidents, as well as bootleggers and smugglers and other common and petty criminals. But the political dissidents included Northern Democrats thought to be too sympathetic to the South. They included the so-called Copperheads, Northern Democrats with Southern sympathies like Clement Ballandigan, who was convicted in a military tribunal for declaring disloyal sentiments and opinions, including at political rallies, and in one case, urging his fellow Democrats to rise up and throw King Lincoln from his throne. So the suspension of habeas corpus prevented the winnowing of wheat from chaff, the separation of terrorists and conspirators against the Union from political dissidents and common thieves. It would have been access to civilian courts that could have served that purpose. And in the 1866 Milligan decision, with which I opened, the Supreme Court said as much said habeas corpus should not have been suspended, access to civilian courts should have been allowed, and said the court, martial law can never exist where the courts are open and in the proper and unobstructed exercise of their jurisdiction. So 1866 said that what happened in 1861 and in the years in between had been excessive, more of a suspension of a great civil liberty than was needed. Let's take as a second example set of suspensions of civil liberties that took a longer time for reflection and correction. Let's go back for a moment to 1917, 1918, the nation's entry reluctantly into the hostilities of World War I. On the home front, a series of acts were passed, the Espionage Acts, the Sedition Acts, acts to prevent the obstruction of the draft as American troops were called up for combat in European and then Russian theaters. Well, a great many of those acts were used to prosecute not just people who literally stood in the way of the draft, but those who issued leaflets and published cartoons in magazines expressing socialist or anarchist or pacifist thoughts or sympathies with the new Bolshevik government. In short, those acts were used to prosecute more speech, perhaps, than at any time in the nation since the Alien and Sedition Acts were used at the turn of the 18th century to prosecute Republican protesters to Federalist policies. There was also widespread persecution and prosecution, both public and private, through vigilante groups, of people for being aliens or immigrants or people with hyphenated names or people of German background. There was a resurgence of nativism that came out of that period, anti-immigrant fervor that was in some sense repeated again in the 20s in the famous Palmer raids, raids led by then Attorney General Edward Palmer against many people for having done nothing more than having been foreign born. Well, the reaction to that period of suspension of principles of freedom of speech and principles of equal protection of the law was longer in coming. Interestingly, it was the Palmer raids that helped give birth to the American Civil Liberties Union, which started to represent many immigrants and speakers affected during the scare in World War I and the Red Scare in the 20s. And it was largely that pushback from the American Civil Liberties Union as by other groups that led to a series of protections for civil liberties in the courts. But it was not really until much later in the century, half a century later indeed, that the dissents of Justices Holmes and Brandeis who said that persecuting the free speech of pacifists and socialists and anarchists was unmerited, 
you shouldn't persecute speech unless it presents a true, clear, and present danger of material harm to the nation. You shouldn't just prosecute ideas. You should prosecute only triggers to action. It took a half century for the Supreme Court to express as a majority the view held in those dissents. It wasn't until 1969 that the court said clearly, it is fine to express advocacy of ideas that go against the government, even in times of national security crisis, as long as those ideas are not on the imminent brink of stirring up serious violence or other material harm. So a half century to correct the divergence from principles of freedom of speech and equal protection of the law that went to the World War I and the 1920s Red Scare period. And last example from history, take the internment of the Japanese and Japanese American uh, aliens and citizens who were resident in the western United States in the wake of the attack on Pearl Harbor in 1942. Well, at the time, then Governor Earl Warren, later Chief Justice of the United States, and then President FDR, allowed the internment, the quarantine, the forced relocation and confinement of those many people without any individualized proof that any of them were spies or traitors or in sympathy with the Japanese government against which many of their sons were fighting on behalf of America in the war. At the time, the Supreme Court in cases like Korematsu in 1942 upheld that internment and said, yes, it violates the principle of equal protection of the law, presumptively, to round up people on the basis of race or ancestry, normally for a free people, to inhibit anybody's liberty on the basis of their ancestry alone is odious. But, said the court in Korematsu, here it was justified by necessity, reason of state, not enough time to be sure of loyalty, not enough time for individualized review, for separating out the wheat from chaff, for separating out the traitors and saboteurs from the honest, hard-working, loyal Japanese and Japanese-American residents of the West. Well, again, it took a half century, almost, for that excess, that overreaction, to be corrected. Fred Coromanto himself, still alive, but living in Oakland, though frail these days, was vindicated in a so-called quorum nobis procedure, a court hearing, a court in San Francisco, California, that decided many years later that the evidence on which the military had said the internment was required was unfounded. That the absence of evidence of actual treason or espionage in the Western United States by the people interned should have led Congress and the executive to forswear internment and should have led the courts to stop it. Congress joined that view of history four years later in 1988 when it passed legislation providing for an apology and reparation to those 120,000 citizens then interned, although the reparations were late in coming for very few were still alive. Now back in 1942, to take us back to the great Justice Jackson, Justice Jackson dissented in Korematsu. And what he said in his dissent helps again support the idea of a continuous constitution. He said, I understand that military expediency might lead to something like the internment of people of Japanese descent. Military expediency might do it, but I will not pronounce it constitutional. I will not say that there's an exception to the principle of equality regardless of race that happens to come up in wartime. Because if I do that today, said Jackson, then the decision of this court lies around like a loaded weapon to be picked up and used in peacetime. The principles of racial equality must be continuous, whether in war or peace. Now, if those thoughts about what a constitution is, that reminder that its text, unlike the text of other constitutions, does not provide for any emergency exception or suspension, if those repeated lessons from history, where we look back at suspending habeas corpus, freedom of speech, principles of racial equality, just because we're frightened, if not all that is enough to convince us that a continuous constitution is important, let's look at a few contemporary factors that ought to make us especially cautious to give up on a continuous constitution in today's world, 
We're, we're truly globalized, where communication and transportation mean that no, no nation is isolated in its own behavior. In this newly internationalized context, I would suggest, it's even more important that we stand as the city on the hill, the beacon of liberty on which so much of international human rights law has been based, as a nation that doesn't derogate from its own constitution when it is under attack. A nation that can respond, for example, to our British and Australian allies in the recent war in Iraq who say, we don't want our nationals now housed in Briggs and Guantanamo to be tried by military tribunals. We don't think that's consistent with the principles of human rights, which we thought the American Constitution stood for. So both as an example uh, to our allies and to an example to our enemies, the continuous Constitution is important. Many point back to the example of the troubles that came out of Northern Ireland in the 1970s and 80s that led the British to have internment without trial and preventive detention of suspected terrorists. And many would say that the example of the internment of suspected terrorists, suspected IRA sympathizers during that period, did not work. It did not work because it turned many peace-loving Irish people against the British government during that period. It inhibited intelligence and information gathering. So it is not only to your allies that you want to represent the continuous constitution, it's also to make sure that those who might become your enemies if you don't, don't turn against you. But if that isn't enough from the international context to make us have pause about suspending our constitution in the war on terrorism, let's remember an important fact. You might think there could be an emergency suspension for the duration of a finite war, a war that takes place in bounded space and time, a war like the terrible civil war that ripped our nation apart, or even World War I or World War II, a war that involves uniformed combatants representing nation states who will come to an armistice, a day of judgment, when the war is over. But in this new globalized war on terrorism, perpetrated by an amorphous and invisible band of ununiformed, sub-state, non-sovereign combatants, there will be no VT day on which we can declare an end to the war on terrorism. And it does not take place, it most terribly does not take place in a bounded space. It spilled onto the homeland, as you heard about from Homeland Security. Secretary Tom Ridge on Monday. In a war that is not bounded in time and space, an internationalized, globalized war like the war perpetrated by terrorists, emergency exceptions are especially dangerous because they cannot be confined, they cannot be cabined, and we should resist them most in that context, not least. But of these instances, 
that things could be much worse, that government is in many ways far more honorable and far more faithful to the Constitution than governments of prior time, but we still must be vigilant. Let's start with procedure and the first principles there. We're committed to due process, to clear notice of the charges against people in criminal proceedings. The burden resting on the government to prove guilt rather than charge persons to prove innocence. We don't believe in torture or coerced confessions. We don't allow people to be made to incriminate themselves. We give rights to confront witnesses. And we have rights of publicity and access to counsel, rights for the public and the press to be present at trials, and access, as I've mentioned before, to civilian courts, the writ of habeas corpus to let a civilian court, not just the executive branch of government, say what good reason there is for us to be confined. Now those are the first principles. Have we learned from previous deviations from the Constitution? Yes, we have. Martial law was declared in Honolulu in the wake of the bombing of Pearl Harbor on December 7, 1942. Martial law was not declared in New York City or the District of Columbia on the 12th of September. So we're not deviating from constitutional procedures as much as we sometimes have in the past. But still, let's consider three areas of troubling deviation from our commitment to procedure. First, the special deportation proceedings ordered in the wake of 9-11 for over a thousand deportable aliens all across the country, in which, by order of the central authorities over immigration and naturalization, the proceedings were closed. No lists of names were provided. No press or council access was provided to the courts in which the proceedings were held. In these special deportation proceedings, the press was not allowed. Now, there may well be a, a showdown about this in the United States Supreme Court. Two different federal appellate courts, one in the Third Circuit, one in the Sixth, came to opposite results about whether these proceedings had to be open. And one said they did, one said they didn't. And the Supreme Court may yet decide that. But think about comparison cases. Think about other cases in which we've been proud to have open hearings. The Nuremberg trials after World War II were open to all the world. The right of publicity is one of the most important aspects of keeping our procedures free. Second troubling example, the treatment of enemy combatants and the treatment of some people involved in this war on terrorism as eligible for trial by military tribunal, even far from the field of battle, far from the traditional venue of military justice, the treatment of even citizens like Mr. Hamdi captured in the war in Afghanistan, or the suspected dirty bomber, Jose Padilla. The government's theory as to enemy combatants is that they may be subject to unilateral justice before military proceedings. They may be detained indefinitely without charges stated against them and without access to counsel. And the government says, well, what's so bad about that? There's precedent for it. Let's go back to the Quirin case in 1942, the case of six German would-be saboteurs who landed by submarine off Long Island, New York, and then filtered down the East Coast, intending to disrupt some industrial production there. They didn't succeed, they weren't very effective, they were rounded up, they were charged and tried in a military tribunal. But importantly, they were given publicity, and they were given access to counsel. So the Quirin case is not precedent for indefinite detention, it's not precedent for denying lawyers even to enemy combatants, and it's not precedent for secret rounded and open trials. So enemy combatants, the treatment of enemy combatants now uh, being considered is a far departure from our normal rules of, rules of procedure. Or let's turn to a third example, what the government is claiming, even in those cases that are being brought against suspected terrorists in civilian court. There's now a controversy going on in the a District of Maryland court where Mr. Masui is being tried, charged with being uh, an aider and a better of Al-Qaeda, Masui wants to exercise his right to confront the witnesses against him. And Judge Brinkema, in that case, the United States federal civilian judge, has said, well, that's a constitutional right. He has to be able to depose another suspected terrorist who's being held in military 
bring abroad, he must be able to depose that person who's a witness against him. And the government is saying, no, that must not be allowed. Important issues of national security are at stake. The right to confront witnesses against you must yield, even in civilian court, to the paramount necessity of wartime. Even if the interrogation could be carefully controlled, even if the judge could seal it, even if it could be carefully monitored, even if no leaks of national security information would be allowed. Now, I would say that in all three of these examples, special deportation proceedings, the treatment of enemy combatants as subject to military justice without charge, without uh, uh, access to lawyers, and without access to uh, publicity, all, and the example of denying rights even in civilian trials of suspected terrorists, these are all too great a departure from our tradition, from our history of protections of procedure to be justified. We can do things in civilian courts that get at the worst uh, enemies of our nation. The uh, successful guilty pleas in the Richard Reed, the Schumacher case, and the John Walker Lind, the American Taliban case, illustrate that ordinary criminal procedure in civilian courts can work, and it works elsewhere in the world. German courts in Hamburg were able to convict suspected al-Qaeda terrorists in their regular civilian courts, so can we. Let me turn second to privacy issues that have been compromised in the wake of the war on terrorism. And let's again go back to first principles. We don't have a privacy clause as such in our Constitution, but we do have a very basic principle of individualized suspicion. We're all supposed to be able to go about our business, to live freely in our houses, to preserve our papers and effects without any red coats rummaging through our doors. That was the concern of the framers. There should be no general searches. There should be no troops trolling through town just seeing if anything suspicious was afoot. Rather, the burden should be the other way around. The default is that we're free to keep our houses, papers, persons and effects, private, unless and until the government has individualized suspicion that we've done something wrong. That's the most basic principle, no general searches, individualized suspicion. Now again, have we learned from history? Have we allowed the kind of dragnets that have occurred and secret government watching that took place in earlier eras? Yes, we have. I have the greatest respect for FBI Director Robert Mueller. He is no J. Edgar Hoover. He is a lawyer and a former prosecutor who cares deeply about the Constitution and uh, the efforts of, of, of FBI agents like Colleen Valley, who you heard uh, show that there are many, you heard here at Chautauqua, show that there are many people in the government who are deeply committed to the importance of individualized suspicion and proper procedure in the way we go about our criminal investigations. We've also seen that a few trial balloons that would really invade our privacy have been shot down almost as soon as they went up. Remember hearing about that TIPS program? <laughs> TIPS was a program that was supposed to make all Chautauquans keep an eye on one another <laughs> to see if anybody might be up to something wrong. It was supposed to make your postman, your meterman, your utility investigators, your anybody around the neighborhood keep an eye and report any suspicious activity going on. Now, of course, in that kind of environment, we are not free. In that kind of environment, we lose what was once called by Justice Harlan the spontaneous frivolity that characterizes everyday life. And Justice Harlan was a very sober, moderate fellow, but even he talked about the spontaneous frivolity that characterizes everyday life. What that means is you don't want to think that your neighbors are spies. We know from the experience of the former East European countries after the end of the Stasi and the secret police that used lots of civilians as spies, as a civilian spy force on one another, we know that the loss of freedom that comes from thinking that everybody around you might be looking into your life is a profound one. But we haven't done that. Tips was shot down as soon as it was floated. And another idea that seemed to threaten our deep commitment to privacy, the Total Information Awareness Project of the Department of Defense, that's the project led by uh, former Iran-Contra uh, convicted uh, criminal admiral John Poindexter. <laughs> this is the total information awareness project is 
represented by an eye over a pyramid. And the idea here is that the government will aggregate in one great database everything it might know about us from our air travel, our bank records, our consumer purchases, our credit card records. And great government electronic sniffer dogs will troll through that information looking for suspicious patterns. <laughs> to the government as a member. 
Now, have we learned from past excesses in racial profiling? Yes, we have. We have not had another internment of Muslim American men comparable to the uh, internment of Japanese uh, aliens and citizens after World War II. We have not had any equivalent of the Palmer raids where people were rousted from their homes simply by virtue of being Arab American or otherwise a suspect in the eyes of their neighbors. We have not had a term, we have not had Palmer raids, and yet we've had occurrences since 9-11 that are troubling, that are out of step with the continuous constitution. We've had the special deportation proceedings, almost all against Muslim men from Arab countries. We've had special registration in which adult men from a certain set of listed countries, mostly in the Middle East, have been required to register with the INS on pain of criminal penalty, even if they're otherwise legally resident aliens. We had a sweep of interviews after 9-11 targeted at Muslim men, including lots of students on campuses like mine. We've had an FBI inventory of mosques, mosques, to make sure that there's no criminal activity being shielded under cover of freedom of religion. And here again, the return to the continuous constitution says, by all means, look for terrorists, but profile terrorists, not Muslims. Profile terrorists and criminals, not those who have a certain nationality or race or ethnicity or religion. The Constitution... <laughs> the Constitutional Protection of Civil Liberties, I want to stress to you, does not require weak government. It requires smart government. Government that goes after the right people. <laughs> so let me close by just taking you back to the National Constitution Center and to a vivid image that you'll see there if you go visit in Philadelphia. You'll see a panorama of how We the People has grown from 1789 to include all the immigrants who've come through Ellis Island and other ports in the United States to create this great, plural, polyglot, multiracial, multicultural nation. You'll see a film that begins with the framers in Philadelphia and ends with all the people who are We the People 2003, including Muslim women and burqas, including people attending mosques as well as the chapels and churches that brought those fleeing religious persecution to the founding of the United States. It is the duty, I argue to you, in our generation to make sure we keep the Constitution alive continuously for all those people in We the People 2003, that we don't allow our government, however well-intentioned, to tear a black hole in the fabric of our great constitutional law, to make sure, again to close with the great words of Justice Robert Jackson, to make sure that the Constitution does not become like a munificent bequest in a pauper's will, a promise to the ear to be broken to the hope. One continuous Constitution. Thank you very much.